past and has really made amazing discoveries um, that will help us all you know, for a long time. He's a research professor at SUNY Downstate in the Department of Medicine and Cell Biology. Um, his research interests include um, biochemical and uh, molecular aspects of B12 and folate absorption, transportation, and metabolism, uh, genetic abnormalities in these um, pathways, um, and the cellular and metabolic consequences of B12 and folate deficiencies. Um, he's looked at um, uh, B12 and folate and homocysteine metabolism in elderly population with cardiovascular disease and cognitive disorders, including Alzheimer's, um, um, and, uh, um, and uh, looked at the neuropathology of uh, these disorders um, and its effect on the brain. Um, uh, active areas of research in his lab um, include, and are most important um, to autism, the folate receptor um, um, autoimmunity, um, how it relates to both neurotube defects and cerebral folate deficiency and autism. Um, his uh, research focuses on fetal and neonatal brain developments and the role of folate and B12 in this process. Um, and uh, and he, is, he has really uh, been the one that found the folate receptor alpha autoantibody, which I think is really a, an extremely important um, uh, finding that will help us therapeutically in um, helping to improve the lives of children, both by prenatal treatments, improving neurotube defects, the development of uh, or preventing the development of neurodevelopmental disorders um, and um, autism. Um, so um, he holds a, a bachelor's in chemistry from the University of Huan, um, master's in applied biology from the University of Bombay, and a PhD in biochemistry from the University of London. So with that, I'll, I will leave it to Ed to um, uh, give you a fantastic talk. Thank you, Richard, for that uh, great introduction. It's a pleasure to participate in this uh, conference. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Should I hit the full screen? Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, Okay. All right. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can. I'm seeing you, Richard. Can I see me? I can see your slides. No, but can I? Where am I? I don't see myself. Oh, I, I don't know. Okay. I can't see you. Okay. But All I right. I can see your slides. I, I can see many people here. Okay. Um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about folates, folate receptor autoantibodies, and the connection to autism spectrum disorders. In terms of disclosure, I would like to mention that uh, the patent for the uh, measurement of uh, folate receptor autoantibodies is owned by the university, the research foundation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the off-label use of folate or folinic acid in this case. So what is autism? We know autism as a behavioral disorder, and it is pretty evident that it is as a result of disordered brain development during fetal life and early childhood. The causes of autism remain unresolved Consensus dictates that it is a multifactorial disease. That means it is not a single gene disorder. It does not follow Mendelian inheritance and it doesn't follow typical uh, Mendelian genetics. It is multifactorial and those factors remain unresolved. Now, what is folate? 
and how does it connect to brain development and function? This is what I'm going to discuss today and ask a, a rather reactionary question like, could a single nutrient contribute to the clinical phenotype of autism? Okay. Now, just to introduce folate to the uh, audience here, folate is a generic term used for vitamin B9. Folic acid, as we know, uh, seen in preparations of multivitamins and uh, other B-complex vitamins is a pharmaceutical preparation that does not exist in the body, but can be readily converted to metabolically active form. It's used in pharmaceutical preparation because it's a very stable form and it can be readily synthesized. Now, normally during absorption, folic acid is rapidly converted to methylfolate due to the high dihydrofolate reductase and methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase activity in the gut. So at physiologic concentrations, when folate is introduced in the diet or orally, uh, most of it will be converted to methylfolate before it reaches to cir circulation. Therefore, methylfolate is the major circulating form of folate and is taken into cells by the folate receptor alpha or the reduced folate carrier. Under physiologic conditions, it is primarily the reduced folate, uh, the folate receptor alpha that functions, which has a very high affinity both for oxidized form as a folic acid or as a reduced form of methylfolate. The reduced folate carrier, on the other hand, does not transport uh, folic acid, but it can transport methylfolate and other reduced forms of folate. However, it needs a high local concentration for it to be activated and transport. All of the metabolically active forms are generated from methylfolate via the enzyme methionine synthase, which is a B12-dependent enzyme, and the dihydrofolate reductase enzyme. Okay, so, uh, before you get overwhelmed by this, let me simplify this diagram for you. It, what it shows is basically all of the single carbon exchange reactions and metabolic pathways involving folate. So folic acid is converted by dihydrofolate reductase to tetrahydrofolate, and that tetrahydrofolate pool then forms all of the reduced uh, forms of folate that are actively involved in transporting single carbon units or carbon skeletons for the synthesis of various compounds. Among them, most important is the synthesis of purines and pyrimidines, which contribute to DNA and RNA synthesis and ultimately to cell replication. Um, it is also involved in uh, production of uh, methionine via the uh, homocysteine methionine conversion. And this requires vitamin B12. And the methionine form is an important precursor for maintaining intracellular uh, SAM or s adenosyl methionine, which is considered a universal methyl donor for methylation of DNA, RNA, and proteins. Okay. Uh, it, the homocysteine there is also a contributor to cysteine production, which is very high in the brain, by the way. And cysteine produced from there is a source of uh, cysteine for glutathione production, which is important for maintaining the so-called cellular redox state and mitochondrial function. On the other hand, um, if you look on the left bottom side here, one of the purines produced is GTP. GTP, GTP is hydrolyzed uh, by the GT enzyme GTP cyclohydrolase to produce tetrahydrobiopterin which is the important uh, cofactor for the hydroxylation of aromatic amino acids to produce neurotransmitters. So as you can see from this diagram that there are so many pathways and so many reactions that can basically control cell replication uh, and metabolic reactions. So it could have a profound effect on brain development and function as you see in fetal as well as neonatal brain development. 
So to summarize, since folate has a major role in purine synthesis that leads to DNA synthesis and methylation reactions that leads to regulation of gene expression, this could profoundly affect neural development and that in turn could affect uh, brain function. And hence the connection between folate and developmental disorders. So looking at folate, there are many ways one could develop folate deficiency, whether it is malabsorption, low dietary folate, or genetic defects of folate pathways. And more recently added to this repertoire is the folate receptor or antibody that could uh, impede the function of folate transport. Folate deficiency, on the one hand, as seen on the left here, could, could lead to uh, various pregnancy-related disorders. Uh, that includes uh, infertility, miscarriage, uh, preterm birth, neural tube defect pregnancy, and uh, other gestational disorders. Uh, shown on the right-hand side here is what could potentially happen after birth to the developing brain. Here you could have uh, effect on metabolic processes, DNA RNA synthesis, again, the methylation and epigenetic regulation, effect on neurotransmitters, neurogenesis. Uh, among them, what is seen and identified in autism is the cortical layering def defects, external connections, and dendritic branching and pruning. So one can envision a scenario where basically so many different things are affected uh, that not one single uh, pathway or cause could be attributed to what we see in autism spectrum disorders. So just to uh, introduce folate receptor autoimmune disorder here, folate receptor autoimmune disorder presents with blocking and binding antibodies in the blood, which can be readily measured uh, by um, standardized assays. What we know so far is that approximately 70% of the children with autism spectrum disorder are positive for both either blocking, binding, or both of these antibodies. These antibodies are prevalent in families with ASD children and ASD patients. What we know so far is about 38% of the parents are also positive for these antibodies. What is really interesting and fascinating is that these antibodies are also prevalent in unaffected siblings. Now, the main question here is why are these children not affected? And this is a major topic for discussion, which I would not go into here, but just to indicate that there could be multiple factors that protect one uh, fetus from the effects and another fetus is affected. So this could happen under various circumstances and we could discuss this at a different uh, conference later. Now, the presence of folate receptor antibodies uh, uh, causes these neurologic deficits associated with uh, autism spectrum disorder. But how severe the neurologic defect is and the onset of the defect is dictated by the appearance and the title of antibodies. So to show here, if at a very young age, the child develops antibodies, this could lead to a very severe form of a developmental deficit, such as the CFD syndrome. Uh, as the child develops antibodies later on between the years two and five, it could lead to spastic ataxic syndrome, intellectual disability, as well as learning deficits. And if the child develops later on between the age of five and 12, it could lead to a milder uh, ASD conditions such as Asperger's syndrome or psychotic disorder. And typically in older children, uh, in addition to autism, we also find uh, dystonia and schizophrenia associated with folate receptor or antibodies. Now, in terms of uh, the effect of antibodies, there are a number of factors that dictate the outcome. And here we, I'm showing you a diagram of uh, uh, maternal and paternal antibodies. If both parents are positive for the antibodies and the fetus is exposed to the antibody during embryonic and fetal development, the 
prognosis is poor and the disease is severe. If the father is negative for the antibody and the mother is positive for the antibody, again, this could lead to severe autism because the fetus is constantly exposed to the maternal antibody and uh, uh, the response treatment depends on how the early diagnosis and rigorous treatment. If the father is positive and the mother is negative for the antibody, typically this could result in moderate to uh, severe autism with variable prognosis. So therefore, identifying parents and screening them for folic antibody antibodies becomes critical in the uh, prevention and management of autism in the offspring. Now, what if the both parents are negative for the antibodies? And this scenario does exist where the child develops antibodies to the folate receptor. And what we do know is the earlier the child is uh, exposed to a milk antigen, folate receptor is present in high quantities in uh, animal milk and milk products. So the earlier the child is introduced to uh, bovine milk, and if the child is susceptible to the autoimmune disorder, the child will develop high titers of the both blocking and binding type of antibodies and will develop severe CSF folate deficiency and folate de cerebral folate deficiency syndrome. Okay. Now, if the child is exposed to antibodies, again, uh, milk products early on, uh, that child may not develop um, high titer or antibodies, it may develop a moderate titer of antibodies and will eventually uh, show up as acquired infantile autism. Uh, again, early diagnosis and treatment has a favorable outcome here. Now, the best scenario is when the child is not exposed to bovine or other sources of animal milk for a longer period, such as a mother breastfeeding perhaps for a year or longer. And in this case, the child develops antibody later on and uh, if, if at all, the child could develop a milder form of uh, autism later on in life. So the best scenario here is to try and avoid animal milk and milk products as long as possible to prevent this sort of thing occurring. So in terms of treatment strategy, clearly a milk-free diet and high dose folate administration would be the ideal thing to do. So the question here is now, what is the folate form of choice? And uh, in, as pharmaceutical preparations, you have folic acid available, which is a very stable form, readily available and cheap. Then there is methyl folate, which is not so stable, but it is also readily available. And then there is folinic acid. The question is, which form should be used in the treatment of uh, ASD. So to address this question, we, we, we looked at folate absorption in the rat. We took adult rats and uh, looked at folate absorption after oral administration. So we used folic acid, 5-methyl, Leucovorin, which is DL folinic acid, only the L form is metabolically active, and Fusilib or Levoleucovorin, which is only the L form and is fully metabolically active. If you look at the purple bar down the panel, you'll see that no matter which form is used, a typical peak activity concentration in the blood is seen around 60 minutes. Uh, the green bar shows conversion to methylfolate, and most forms are converted to methylfolate, perhaps more so in the case of levoleucovorin. Also, there is more tetrahydrofolate form from levoleucovorin. Uh, the one thing about using folic acid is that, as you see on the red bar here, there is a significant amount of unconverted folic acid appearing in the circulation. So looking at unconverted 
uh, compound appearing in circulation, uh, the red bars show folic acid, and there is a very high amount of folic acid in circulation. Mind you, the dose administered here was four milligrams per kilogram body weight, which is twice the dose that is highest dose given to children with the autism spectrum disorder. And at this pharmacologic dose, clearly there is a significant amount of unconverted folic acid appearing in circulation. There is some recent literature uh, criticizing the use of folic acid even as a supplement because they feel that the folic unconverted folic acid has a negative effect metabolically and it can, may be detrimental to folate metabolism. So clearly in this case where pharmacologic doses are administered, folic acid is not the compound of choice. Uh, methylfolate on the other hand can be administered and it appears unconverted into circulation as seen here. Um, uh, uh, and it can be readily converted to uh, other forms of folate via the uh, enzyme, the methionine synthase and the hydrofolate reductase. So looking at the next two panels here, DL-folinic acid and levofolinate, uh, the most of the levofolinate is converted to methylfolate. And the advantage of using DL-folinate or levofolinate is that both forms can be used. Uh, both forms can be utilized in metabolic processes. So even if it is not converted to methylfolate, the form that is not converted can be readily be readily used in metabolic reactions. So to connect folate receptor antibodies to autism spectrum disorder, we looked at the rat model of exposure to antibodies during pregnancy. A rat model of exposure to folate receptor antibodies shows behavioral deficits such as social interaction deficits, learning, memory, and cognition deficits in the pups. And these, this data is all published, is out there in the public domain. These deficits can be prevented by pre-administration of folinic acid. So what could be the potential mechanism, both of the pathology as well as the rescue? To investigate this, we looked at folate and folate antibody transport to the fetus and to the brain. So shown on the right top panel here is the brown staining material is the presence of folate receptor antibodies, in this case, rat folate receptor antibody administered intraperitoneally and its distribution in a pregnant rat. So you can see there is a tremendous accumulation in the placenta, in the yolk sac, as well as in the embryo, much less in the embryo. A quantitative evaluation of that say, indicates that most of the antibody collects in the uterus and in the placenta, very little goes to the embryo. And you can see higher magnifications of the embryo here. Again, accumulation in the uh, embryo as well as in the chamber ventricles and the choroid plexus. Now, what is the result of that? The result of that is if you give now radioactive folic acid to an animal which has received the antibody, what it does is it blocks folate It blocks folate transport. Uh, that blockage is seen most in the embryo. Here's the normal embryo. Here is the embryo receiving a folate receptor antibody, one or two doses, depending on 48 or 72 hours. And that results in a significant decrease in folate transport to the embryo. I want to get this thing out of there. Okay. All right, uh, next slide. So uh, then we asked the question, is the distribution of the uh, folate itself, folic, in this case, we use biotin uh, conjugated folic acid to try and trace it. And when we gave it to pregnant rats, as you look at the distribution in the placenta and in the embryo itself, 
This is as early as 30 minutes after IPA injection. You can see there is tremendous accumulation of folic acid uh, in the placenta, in the embryo. You see at 30 minutes, there's a lot of accumulation in the heart, in the liver, and also regions of the brain, but much less so. And at by one hour, there is more accumulation of this um, in the embryo and a higher magnification down here shows uh, all that brown staining stuff is now folate distribution within the uterus, the placenta, as well as the embryonic tissue, including the choroid plexus and regions of the brain. So clearly the uh, antibody distributes to regions similar to where the folate would be distributed. And this could affect folate uh, uptake and deposition within the uh, brain tissue. And when we looked at a young brain, in this case, PND22 rat brain, again, IP injected biotin PGA distributes to, this is the cerebrum, this is the cerebellum, and the time course ranging from five minutes all the way to overnight. And as you can see, as early as five minutes, you start see the, seeing the appearance of a biotin PGA within the brain, uh, much less so in the uh, cerebellum, but with increasing time and by 30 minutes, you see a fairly large accumulation of uh, folic acid in the uh, cerebrum as well as in the cerebellum. And this accumulation, even though it seems to de decrease a little over overnight period, uh, it seems to remain so much so in the cerebrum and the distribution is typically seen around the uh, tracks of the white matter in here. And uh, seen in the next slide is a higher magnification of this showing you uh, distribution of biotin PGA uh, after inject interperitoneal injection. As you can see, most of the distribution is in the white matter tracts, in the internal capsule area, the external capsule area, uh, the fimbria and in the ventricular chamber in the choroid plexus. Now, if the, if the folate is administered uh, 24 hours after antibody administration, this distribution is, is decreased. You can see there's no specific area of decrease, but overall there is a decrease in folate distribution within the white matter of the cerebrum. And if one looks at the uh, antibody distribution, you can see there is a high accumulation of antibody in the choroid plexus. Uh, antibody distribution can also be seen in the microvascular, in the blood vessel, in the brain itself. So there is a clear uh, effect of the antibody uh, on uh, folate distribution in the brain. And this could be the reason why uh, the presence of antibody leads to cerebral folate deficiency. Now, one of the questions we have tried to address is, um, is the behavioral deficits that we see in pups exposed to antibody during uh, pregnancy, is this transmissible to subsequent generation? If it is, it would indicate that there, it is epigenetic. There are cha epigenetic changes. This could be in the methylome, uh, ex gene expression profiles, and then it could readily be transmitted to subsequent generation. The reason for asking this question is that uh, autism runs in families, autism, uh, and, but it is not a genetic disorder in the sense that Mendelian genetics is transmitted, but it is a disorder that runs in families. There is a genetic component involved. So we wanted to see uh, if the behavioral deficits that we see in F1 generation, these are the pups exposed uh, to the antibody during pregnancy, would transmit to subsequent generation. And from this preliminary study, whether it is looking at uh, vocalizations on PND4 
which is a indicator of bonding between the mother and the newborn pups, or whether it is looking at male vocalizing of uh, bonding in the older pups, as well as active and conflict avoidance tests, which are indicators of deficits in higher learning, such as uh, learning, memory, and cognition. Could, are these present in the first generation and are they transmitted to subsequent generation? And from this experiment, it appears the answer is yes, that in fact, the deficits that we see in the pups directly exposed to the antibody are transmitted to subsequent generation. So what is the relevance of this experiment and how could this experiment then lead to subsequently trying, identifying the potential causes of developmental deficits that we see in uh, patients exposed to folate receptor antibodies lies in the fact that this animal model allows us to look at the epigenome, the methylome, and also identify the genes involved. It also allows us to basically experimentally manipulate the epigenome and to see if we can change it or restore it so that we can prevent these deficits being transmitted to subsequent generation. These are very important studies that could perhaps lead, uh, provide an answer to the behavioral deficits that we see in exposure to folate receptor antibody and folate deficiency. Uh, we are most grateful for um, the Brain Foundation for funding this ongoing research and hopefully for the future research, which is going to need a lot of funding to really look at the epigenome, the genome, and to see how we can restore the normalcy to this genome to prevent transmission of these behavioral deficits. So uh, in conclusion, levofolinate has shown great promise in the treatment of ASD. And this is evident from trials that have already been completed by Dr. Fry and uh, Dr. Ray Makers. And um, with significant improvement in speech, communication, and social interaction. There are at least three clinical trials ongoing, and hopefully this will give us more data. I believe that it holds most promise, perhaps in the prevention of ASD, by identifying and treating parents prior to conceiving. Therefore, screening for folate receptor antibodies, reducing antibody titer, and providing adequate folate are critical for a positive outcome. Maternal cord blood testing for folate receptor antibodies could provide for follow-up and early intervention in the newborn to prevent development of ASD. So that's our ultimate hope to see how we can prevent the development of ASD. The last uh, data I heard from the CDC is now one in 44 children diagnosed with ASD. This upward trajectory needs to be changed, stopped or shifted to the downward trajectory. And we, uh, our hope is that we may be able to do it if we can identify what is the cause at the genetic level that is causing this. I have uh, many people to thank for some of the work that I presented here today. Uh, up top panel is my lab group. Most of the work I presented was done by an MD PhD student Ankuri here and Jeffrey Sequera, my research assistant. Um, current ongoing work. Oh, how do I get back to this? Jeez, what happened? Okay, current ongoing work is being done by Natasha, my graduate student, and hopefully we will have some answers in the near future. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Ed. Uh, that was really terrific. What a wonderful okay. talk and it's such uh, promising work. I think uh, Dr. Woody has the first uh, question. Okay, how do I get back on? I can't, can't see myself or... Just stop sharing. Stop sharing. Let's go back. Okay, great. All right, I'm back. I'm sorry about that last slide. Uh, it flipped and I went back to the first slide. Okay, uh, so the questions are in the QA or chat. They are. Dr. Woody had the first question. Did you want to? Uh... Dr. Woody is in uh, chat or? 
or he Q can, and A? He can, no, he can just uh, say it if he wants. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, if not, you can start. So, Dr. Yeah, Woody, you, you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, are you familiar with the new therapy using anti-FCRN antibodies to eliminate uh, pathologic antibodies in patients, which has actually been used in uh, pregnant women to eliminate anti-red cell antibodies? Yeah, there are, there are treatments to eliminate antibodies. There are also treatments in using uh, drugs that uh, re reduce uh, antibody production. There are also treatments that use IgG, uh, infuse IgG to reduce antibody. These are all general treatments used for a variety of autoimmune disorders. They're not specific for autism related, but they have been used in uh, CFD patients with severe uh, CFD syndrome where the antibody titers are very high. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that has been used to specifically remove folate receptor antibodies. Yeah, the rest of the questions are in the chat. Do you have the chat or you okay. want me to read them yeah. to you? Uh, would you read them to me, Richard? Okay. That would be most helpful. So, so the first question is about, uh, you know, the study that showed high doses or, or you know, uh, high levels of folic acid in the blood maternally is been linked to, um, to autism. And the question is, how would a too high dose of folic acid in the pregnancy okay. lead to increased autism? Would it be through in vitro hurting the child or through an autoimmune reaction of the mother? Okay. Most of the studies reported, they did not involve pharmacologic folic acid administration. They were in the general population showing small amounts of unmetabolized folic acid. My explanation for that is if you're on a daily B complex or multivitamin that includes folic acid, you're likely to see some fo unmetabolized folic acid in circulation. Uh, there could be some unmetabolized folic acid intracellularly also because uh, the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase uh, is not able to very efficiently you metabolize all of the folic acid. So if the concentration drops below the KM, you're gonna have some folic acid in the circulation. Whether it causes uh, autism, I'm a bit skeptical about that. I'm not sure, I'm not buying that theory, even though they have shown that there is some link statistically between these two. Okay, next question is, given the transgenerational influence at what gestational stage um, is the FRAT most beneficial for prenatal testing? The, ideally, the FRAT should be used in parents before conceiving. If both parents are positive or one parent is positive, they should be treated both to reduce the antibody titer and to uh, provide adequate folate. That would be the ideal scenario where the parents are screened prior to conceiving. And if that is not done, then I think uh, introducing larger doses of uh, folinic acid during pregnancy uh, and also during early childhood may uh, help prevent the uh, you know, disorder, those who are susceptible to the disorder. Okay. Now, an interesting question. What is the range of epitopes? What is known about the um, immunogenicity of the bovine folate receptor, um, that is, immunogenic polymorphisms? Um, any info on different strains of cows? Have, we, have you looked directly at the methylome in rats in high titer or in high titer humans? We have not looked at the methylome in the rats or uh, humans, but that is clearly our objective to going forward to look at the uh, epigenome in some detail and to see what changes have taken place. And can we restore these changes by providing folinic acid uh, to uh, the rats before pregnancy and during pregnancy and see if the outcome changes. Now, what was the first part of the question? Uh, whether there's any um, um, epitopes specifically. Is okay. there any, so you know, what, anything? Yeah. yeah. So what we do know is that uh, bovine milk is highly immunogenic. So is camel milk folate receptor. The least immunogenic is actually goat milk. Even though goat milk contains about twice as much folate receptor as bovine and camel milk. Okay. 
Uh, epitope wise, the antibodies that we have identified are blocking type. So they bind to the active site of the folate receptor, whether it is uh, irrespective of which source the antigen comes from. And then there are binding antibodies which identify epitopes that are distinct from the folate binding sites. All of these um, antigens have greater than 95% homology in terms of amino acid sequence. Okay, and one more question we have time for. Is there any relation between maternal age and FRAT? Maternal age and FRAT. Good question. I don't know the answer to that because we really haven't looked at uh, age-wise. I can tell you this, that they, when we've looked at women with neural tube defect pregnancy, these women mostly were in their late 30s and 40s. They've had an uh, NTD child maybe eight years earlier or 10 years earlier, but they still were positive for the antibody. So once you have the autoimmune disorder, you're likely to be positive for a long time. Now, one thing that reduces the titer of the antibody and eventually gets you to negative uh, area is if you go on a totally milk-free diet, as was the case with one mother who we have published this, had repeated uh, miscarriages and uh, had difficulty in conceiving. She had a high titer of the antibody and she was put in a milk-free diet for over a year. And at the same time, she was monitored for this uh, antibody titer. And eventually she became negative for the titer. She conceived normally, carried to term and had a normal child. Super. Well, you can answer the rest of them in the chat, Ed. Okay. Um, you can get to it, and uh, we can move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. All right. So it's my pleasure now to uh, to measure. To